I'm Frederick Gerten, and I'm the filmmaker. And I'm Leilani Farha, and I'm the advocate. And this is Pushback Talk, Season 5. Leilani, we are still up out there. Could We're you imagine still doing that it. When, we, when we started? It's like... Uh, Never imagined five seasons, but then I never imagined this pandemic would be three years long. <laughs> <laughs> and now we've we, we found out that we have downloads in 147 countries, which Amazing. is very close to 150. So who are the next coming in? Interesting, exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, the code word for today's podcast is extreme. I mean, so the, the extreme could be... Uh, a war against another nation or a war against the poor yes. or, you know. Climate change. The climate change. Puerto yeah. Rico. Yeah, Port uh, there's, there's a lot of things cooking that could make us think, oh my God, this is extreme. Yeah. But, but now we're back to something that's close to your heart and your advocacy as lifetime advocacy against homelessness. And you taught yeah. me a lot about this because it's, uh, it's sometimes easy or not easy to 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 look the, in the other direction because it's it's painful and it's it's messy and it's complicated to to handle yes but we will start up in a small town in in canada london ontario with our dear friend dan uthorn who is um, an author teacher outreach worker and he's in something called the Forgotten 519. And he was ready to go on a hunger strike. Dan, tell us about a hunger strike against poverty. What is this? Yeah, so uh, what we've been seeing in London, Ontario over the last several years um, is a situation of increasing impoverishment um, and increasing um, deprivation of housing and access to shelter um, to, to large numbers of people. So this has been accumulating over quite some time. London was particularly hard hit uh, in the uh, opioid crisis. Um, and then changes to medications that occurred with uh, um, doctors being um, fearful of losing licensing if they continued to prescribe opioids to, to folks who had been receiving them for many years, and so we saw a criminalization of healthcare for mass amounts of people who are impoverished, which then led to uh, um, turning towards less legal forms of um, accessing medication, toxic um, drug poisonings happening um, through those supply chains. So going going really back to 2014, we started to see an uptick of deaths. Um, uh, that this was exacerbated into 2016 again we saw another big uptake and then of course with uh, the covid pandemic hitting and a lot of people losing the the little access they had to community spaces to spaces for food for shelter for um basic uh, human needs um so what what we've what we've witnessed especially in the last three years is a mass explosion of preventable deaths amongst people who are forcibly impoverished and deprived of housing and that is much uh, I think more honest language than than talking about people experiencing homelessness, as though homelessness is just like a something you catch like a cold. Um, rather, <laughs> there there are options for people. There are empty units. There are empty buildings. There are even empty lots where people could camp if they're permitted to do so. Um, and so we've seen this major explosion of of preventable deaths. And, and coupled with that has been a, a major attrition rate amongst frontline workers. So folks who are uh, engaging in outreach services, people who are doing street health care, um, cultural support workers, housing support workers, there's been this mass flight from the field uh, because uh, what we're seeing is just death on a, on a level that we've never seen before. Um, since 2020 in London, we are aware of and have confirmed over 185 deaths. Uh, so London's a small town, 380,000 people. We are personally, so we know the death rate's higher, but we are aware of it and have confirmed um, 180 uh, deaths that were largely preventable due to the enforced um, impoverishment. Leilani, this is your country, and this is your province, Ontario, the richest province in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I guess Canada is quite a rich country, isn't it? Top 10 performing GDP. Absolutely. It's a G7 country. Uh, we're a rich nation. It sounds extreme it's, to me. It's very extreme. And I didn't know those numbers. London, Ontario has the same size as my town, Malmo, Sweden. I, I can tell you we don't have those numbers. We also have 
our issues and, and challenges, but we don't have that number of deaths still. Um, Wow, it's. We'll be back to you, Dan. I want to hear more, but we also have another guest, which is Ananya Roy, who is a professor of urban planning at UCLA in Los Angeles and a long time, also advocate uh, for the, the the homeless. What is? It's also extreme right now in 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 Los Angeles, Ananya. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm so glad to be in conversation with all of you, and I think Dan emphasized the crucial issue of preventable deaths. So I think what we're seeing, whether it be in London, Ontario, or in Los Angeles, is the making um, of death, of preventable death through policy. So here in Los Angeles, we often talk about how we are in, in an era of mass homelessness, 70,000 people who have been unhoused. 70. Yes, and... We are now on the brink of mass evictions, something we've been warning for a while about. So those numbers are going to get a lot worse. Why, why are there mass evictions? Is this because of people lost so much during COVID or do they, I mean... So working class communities of color in Los Angeles for a very long time have already been rent burdened and facing rent... Uh, rent debt and other forms of precarity. Those issues have gotten worse during the pandemic, but also during the pandemic, there were hard won protections in place against evictions, against the displacement of um, encampments. All of that is coming to an end. And I think what we have in liberal cities like Los Angeles, talking about extreme, is I think an extreme vengeance against the poor, right? So it is the complete banishment. We use the term racial banishment to talk about what is happening to poor and unhoused populations. It is a form of social death. Folks are not just stripped of their rights, they're stripped of their community, of their personhood, and it leads to actual death. Mm. It's I, I know you have a, a global perspective also, Ananya, and, and of course also Leilani. When, when I've been traveling the world, which I do a lot in my work, I mean, what I see in Los Angeles or in San Francisco is much worse what I've seen in, in Bombay, India, or what I see in Sao Paulo, Brazil, or what I see in Santiago de Chile or in in many other, you know, Kuala Lumpur or Bangkok. I mean, you don't see what you see in in the north american cities what's wrong with you guys you know <laughs> what i mean why is that the most extreme situations in the richest countries can you can anybody explain that do you have any theories about that i'll get started and i'm sure lalani and dan have a lot to say on this look um i grew up in kolkata india a lot of my research and scholarship has been in the cities of the global south i do not want to romanticize poverty in the global south but I want to make the argument that the constellation of housing rights is fundamentally different in the post-colonial democracies of the global south, right? The kinds of social death I'm talking about um, exist, but not to the scale that we would see in the U.S. So in the co case of the U.S., the reason I'm using the term social death, which comes from Orlando Patterson's work on slavery, all of this is to remind us that we are in a settler capitalist country where the ongoing violence of settler genocide, of slavery, right, continue. These racialized imperial colonial logics are real. And they make the U.S. not exceptional. I mean, we like to think of Canada as being different. And of course, I'm sure... Dan and Lalani will remind us that that is not at all the case. I think we need to take very seriously the ongoing present history of this kind of violence and how it has shaped the relationship between the state and poor people. Well, I, I'm interested to hear what uh, Dan has to say about this. Um, but I, I just want to underscore something that Frederick said. When I was UN rapporteur, I had occasion to go up and down California 
to look at homelessness and homeless encampments. I was writing a report on informal settlements, and I really wanted to make sure to cover what was happening in the global north as much as the global south. And I can only, it's, it's actually underscoring also what Ananya said. I came away from those experiences actually quite traumatized. The cruelty being unleashed on the most disadvantaged and already vulnerable populations. And I traveled the world. I'd met with people in informal settlements in India, in Egypt, in Nigeria, in places around the world. But the cruelty in the United States and up and down California, including in L.A., was shocking to me. It, 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 it actually changed me as a human being and changed my understanding. I remember you calling, yeah. crying. Yeah, I mean, totally you were, distraught. Uh, uh. Um, so only to say it's not to romanticize what happens in the global south, but the relationship between politics and those in power and property versus those who have nothing is just replicating itself again and again. In Canada, we, we, we've witnessed it with the genocidal nature and the nature of colonialism against Indigenous peoples, and now it's playing itself out in homelessness. But I'm going to give the, the mic to Dan because I'd like to hear what he has to say. I, I think a lot of really good things have already been said, but I, I do feel like um, in this portion of Turtle Island, we are really at the heartland of neoliberal subjectivity and neoliberal reason so that um, as this like ongoing like capillary spread of neoliberalism happens now so that like we're not just conquering the globe but now we're moving into ever smaller little community spaces and conquering them to extract as much profit as possible from everywhere possible we, we live in a in our society um, in Canada and the United States the territories they occupy here we, we have lost our ability to imagine anything other than a relationship to land that is one of private property we've lost our ability to imagine ourselves as anything other than human capital or conversely human waste which is then like literal pieces of shit that we walk around on the sidewalk and try to avoid getting dirtied by right so so because people's imagination and subjectivity have been so disciplined by this logic um it it it, it facilitates an utter disregard and, a, and, a, and an extreme cruelty to the suffering of others who are who are then considered to be human waste who are obviously not reasonable responsible or resilient as we should be as as items of human capital tell me how you get started as an as an advocate uh, it would be nice to hear your 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 story uh, for myself, I was plunged into this when I was forcibly deprived of housing as a seventeen year old um uh, i I came from a a pretty uh, actually a very like closed off um very conservative religious home. I was like a book nerd and um I just wanted to like read books and maybe like go to church as a child um because that's what i knew um and then i was thrown out onto the street um and that was um um a very paradigm shifting experience for me and, and and it's worth pointing out that most youth who are on the street are in fact um not necessarily they're not problem kids they're not bad kids the 75 percent of youth who are deprived of housing are, are coming from violence, fleeing violence or being pushed out by violence. And a further 40% within that total, uh, it's it's because their family has engaged in violence towards them based upon their sex or gender. So again, a lot of like really nerdy, maybe even in the United States, especially very devout religious church kids who are suddenly downtown LA, downtown Detroit, downtown Chicago, because their parents said, you're gay, get out of here, don't ever come back. So it's like this kind of label of people being mentally ill. It's like something that may, you might become when you're out on the streets for years, but it's not how you start off, I guess. Yeah, the, in many cases, I mean, you put people in profoundly um, painful, difficult, deprived situations, and that is going to manifest in your health. And 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 also, you will then also, if if you have no way of experiencing comfort or soothing um, from loved ones, you will also turn to other means of self-soothing. Um, or, or substances that will help you stay awake at night because you're afraid of being sexually assaulted. So a lot of the things that people say are causes of um, homelessness are actually uh, um, a result of how people then try to 
survive and in a situation that is designed, as Ananya said, to kill them. Hmm. Ananya, this is also your experience, I guess. Yes, absolutely. I want to go back to also something that um, Dan talked about in, uh, as, as neoliberal reason. This is specificity to this moment, and I'm curious to, for all of us to think through how it's playing out in different parts of the world. So what we're seeing in California and in the U.S., is neoliberal reason, but hands in hand with a massive expansion of resources for housing and homelessness. There is more federal money than there's ever been before, right? This is almost akin to the New Deal. California has a hundred billion dollar budget surplus. So it's not just about wealth, it's this time of surplus the issue is how that money is being spent. And it is being spent in the most perverse way. So Dan talked about how um, in, in, his, in, in, in the part of Turtle Island that he is currently at, it's hard to imagine any relationship to land that is not mediated through the idea of private property. I will say in the US, especially in California, it's hard to imagine any relationship between the state and poor people that's not about caging. So all of this money is being spent on what masquerades as housing or shelter, but is actually caging. Right? It's carcerality. And very perversely, our politicians are using the term right to housing to medicalize and criminalize people. So the right to housing means I'm going to destroy your encampment, which is the home you know. I'm going to pull you out of your community. I'm going to offer you, offer you housing, but it is most likely this carceral setting far out in the desert. But if you say no, you have then not only lost the right to housing, you've lost all rights. And we then have the right to punish you, to penalize you, to imprison you. This is a very, very dangerous moment because I feel that a lot of what folks have fought for have been co-opted and now put into this kind of carceral logic at a time when we have more money available for mm. housing and homelessness than ever before. And I understand that in, in Los Angeles, you have a very special local law called Ordinance 4118. What it, can you tell, tell us about that, that ordinance? Yes, absolutely. So LAMC 4118 um, is a municipal ordinance that allows city council members to basically illegalize encampments and to ban and banish them. It's been on the books for a while. So I, many of these ordinances stay on the books and then city council revives them. There's usually a protracted legal battle much of this is, would, would ultimately the courts are going to find that these ordinances are in violation of the Constitution. But while they are in effect, they do tremendous harm. So 4118 basically has banned unhoused people from large chunks of the city. The latest expansion of 4118 was that um, unhoused encampments are now banned from within 500 feet of any school or daycare center. And this, I think, um, was so cynical because it weaponized school children saying, oh, they should not look at homeless people on their way to school. And in doing so, completely obscured how many school children are in fact themselves experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity. Leilani, you, you wrote to me about this and you were like, you were kind of uh, upset. Tell me. Yeah. Well, talk about extreme and talk about discriminatory. It's a, it is completely based in discriminatory notions of people living in homelessness. Absolutely, right? Because it's not just that children shouldn't see homeless people. It's that they are threatened by homeless people. And the workers, the teachers... The caregivers are all threatened by homeless people. 
You can't. I mean, it. 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 And and it's it's the it's the detail of the ordinance forty one eighteen. You can't sleep within five feet of a fire hydrant. You can't rest in the doorway of a store. You can. It to me the this is a policy of annihilation. It is a it is a hundred. I don't see it any other way. I the logical extension because it's not a policy of. Oh my gosh, we've failed as government. We have people who are living houseless. We better act to make sure these folks actually have homes and services that they need. That's not what this ordinance is. No, this ordinance is we've got a homelessness problem and homeless people are the problem and we're going to make sure they have nowhere to live. And and we know that that means death, which is what we've been talking about. It, it it's evil. It's. I'm sorry, but it is. It's very extreme. Mm. Dan, this is what you are upset about, and you are you are ready to go public in in this kind of uh, in de- defending the people's right to to stay in encampments. Tell me about your your local struggle. Yeah. So. Uh- I mean, a few things happened uh, earlier in the summer um, that provoked uh, mass outrage um, across the sector of frontline workers here. Um, there was kind of these two back-to-back events um, where, first of all, as I mentioned, we've been seeing this this rapid increase year over year of um, preventable deaths, along with everything else that we're seeing, increase of people deprived of housing, increase of... Um, you know, precarious labor, all that stuff, um, but also this mass increase in preventable deaths. And so um, the city called a, uh, a coordinated meeting to, to saying that they wanted to take take steps to address the uh, opioid crisis um, as it was occurring in the core at the start of the summer because some places were seeing um, a 300% increase of overdoses occurring. So we thought, okay, finally we have an opportunity to all come together and we're actually going to take some action. So very well attended meeting with uh, everything from bosses to frontline workers in attendance across the sector. And then it kind of became apparent that actually the meeting was about the city's uh, frustration that the bills that they're paying for calling uh, ambulances to one of the bathrooms that they were managing in the downtown core was uh, was an unacceptable cost to them. So actually what they were wanting was to divert frontline workers from their regular duties to to staff their washroom to tell people to go and get high elsewhere. And this was apparently the solution that they were proposing for um, the opioid crisis uh, that, that we're experiencing. So so this that provoked mass outrage across the frontline workers who thought, finally, maybe we're actually going to do something collectively. Maybe our voices are finally being heard, only to discover this was actually just about them reducing their 911 ambulance fees for their bathroom. So that, that was outrageous. A few hours after that meeting, um, uh, we also received word that a woman who had been found dead in the river um, was actually somebody known very, very well to all of us who actually had been um, reconnected with her family, living in a home, um, had actually um, transferred from uh, street level medication to uh, medication she was receiving from a doctor, uh, was very healthy and very well who had been brought back, it turns out, to London by the police for fingerprinting for a petty crime, even though they already had her prints on file. And she had offered to offer her prints where she was residing, and they declined that. They took her back to London and then turned her out onto the street afterwards without any way of getting home. And two days later, she was dead in the river. Um, So these two events combined together caused a mass outrage, devastation, heartbreak, and anger. And it opened a window of opportunity for coordinated action rising up from below. And and so very quickly, we we created a coalition called the Forgotten 519. 519 is the the oldest telephone area code for this area. Um, And the forgotten refers both to the ways in which the voices and and harms experienced by frontline workers are forgotten and also all the people on the um, who are deprived of housing and um, given over to death um, are are forgotten. And and so we created this coalition um, demanding uh, that the city uh, declare a moratorium on tearing down encampments, uh, that they pivot from having their bylaw enforcement team going around uh, essentially displacing people. to, to supporting people, and also that they create two new uh, 24-7 indoor spaces. Uh, we demanded this of the city. The city said, uh, 
they're we we admire their um care for others but no so tell me i mean but you were ready to go on hunger strike tell me about that yes i did go on a hunger strike yes so because this, we gave the city a week's notice saying uh, should they not follow through on our demands i will we will be initiating a hunger strike the city didn't follow through on the demands didn't really seem to they they were the city's intent was to make the pub to alienate the public from us so that they could ignore us and abandon us to whatever outcomes that was which is what they always do in these situations if, if we can make people not care about these preventable deaths, if we can make people feel like these folks are somehow responsible for their own deaths, then we can ignore it and not do anything about it. So they were seeing it more as like a, a campaign to win the heart of the public. It sounds extreme and it sounds really desperate to go on a hunger strike, Leilani, in, in Canada to, in order to protect uh, homeless people. Is that where you are at now? <laughs> well, I'll probably never go on a hunger strike personally. Um, but I think it's um, a real sign of the times, what Dan and the Forgotten 519 felt they had to do. What I was so moved by about the Forgotten 519 and and um, their decision to go on a hunger strike was, well, two things. One, believe it or not, in conversations with me, London, Ontario, the government, the city government has said that they have a compassionate approach to people living in homelessness. And so Dan has outlined for you what a compassionate approach looks like. <laughs> um, but also the focus of the, the Forgotten 519 on the workers, um, or at least some focus on the workers and their experiences. Because as Dan said at the outset of our conversation, the frontline workers are being put in a position they never foresaw, they weren't trained for. I mean, these are the harshest of conditions to watch people day in and day out that you're caring for die is or overdose and maybe die or, and then, you know, overdose again and maybe die. These are conditions and I've spoken to a lot of frontline workers in Toronto as well as um, in other parts of Canada. And these are not conditions that people can work work under and the solution isn't well let's make let's 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 support the frontline workers the solution is solve homelessness that's it and and that's not where governments are going and ananya's point about the criminalization of homeless people and and dressed up as solutions the the incarceration in a shelter or in a motel sometimes which you know has become this panacea oh motels and hotels i wanted to ask ananya about that because is it are these really solutions or are the, is this just a replication of a colonial approach um, to homelessness. Yes, I mean, this whole question of what the so-called solutions are, right, is, is very much at stake. So I will say um, in the early months of the pandemic in Los Angeles, but also in other parts of the US, it's unhoused communities that really pushed for these um, shelter-in-place hotels. It was a very interesting coalition of interests. There were public health experts who uh, produced important reports showing the dangers of congregate shelter, right? The health dangers. Um, we sort of had the CDC push for um, at least a temporary ban on encampment evictions. And unhoused communities, say, for example, in Echo Park Lake, in the encampment that was that faced eviction at gunpoint uh, later on in the pandemic, um, they folks were like, there are all these vacant hotel rooms. That's where we should be living. And of course, movements for a long time have been pointing out how these hotels, especially the fancy ones, already had benefited from billions of dollars in subsidies in the form of tax breaks, right? So there was a really powerful argument about a public stake in what seemed to be private property, right? And yet all of that um, got transformed into a form of human caging. So in California, and especially in LA, what came to be called Project Roomkey, two things happened. There was a lot of FEMA money the Federal Emergency Management Authority money. So local governments weren't even paying for this. But 
the city of LA chose to leave that money on the table rather than to hit capacity with these hotel rooms, right? But second, they designed a program that is carceral to its core. So I'm a part of a research collective with movement organizers, university-based scholars, and unhoused comrades. And our first report was actually on unhoused deaths. And it was on, on stolen lives. And what we showed, we used, we scraped coroner's data and looked at deaths both on, on sort of the streets, but also in these motels and hotels. The rate of overdose deaths was higher in these programs than on the streets. And we did that work because it's our unhoused comrades living in these PRK hotels who kept saying, you know, we first thought this is a prison, but this is a prison and a morgue. But it need not be this way. None of it need be this way. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's exactly. Let's let's freeze this moment. It doesn't need to be this way. Uh, because I think I'm with our listeners now. That, oh, shit, this is heavy. I mean, wow, is there any way, is there any hope? Or is this cynical world just going to be worse and worse? Okay. Give me some hopes. Give me some perspectives of how we could do this differently. I mean, we this world could have been organized better. We for sure know that. So what are your takes on this? You're, the, you're three out there now. Leilani in Ottawa, Dan in London, Ontario, Alanya in Los Angeles. Tell me, where, where where's the hope? Should we go local first? Dan, why don't you take a super local, small town? What's the answer? I mean, I've been trying to figure out how to build a guillotine. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> then you have to go to Paris, so, Ontario. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, there's some expertise there. There are, um, you know, the way the whole thing is structured is structured so that everything is so interwoven from the municipal to the regional to the federal to the international that trying to, like, institute significant life-affirming, life-giving change within this overarching death-dealing context is, is almost impossible. So, I mean, so, so what do we do recognizing, like, just how hegemonic this death-dealing interwoven web of, of systems of power is? Um, I can give you one reason for hope, uh, Dan, sorry for interrupting, is, is that's actually your work. I mean, and your people out there, it, it gives, I mean, that there are still people out fighting for others is, is really a hopeful thing. A critical thing, I think, the, you know, one of the things we heard over and over when we instituted the hunger strike and when I was down outside of City Hall, because I camped outside of City Hall for the duration of the hunger strike, um, and people, so many folks, uh, progressive folks or conservative folks said, um, we respect what you're trying to do, but you're going about it the wrong way. And in fact, we attained an outcome that nobody thought imaginable. And so a critical lesson here is that the people, in fact, do have a great amount of power um, should they choose to come together and use it. So um, uh, one of the critical victories of uh, the Forgotten 519's action wasn't just that we got the three demands met, but that in fact a lot of people had this realization that if we come together and if we act in unison and if we refuse to play nice with those who want to very politely slaughter us, and that's the difference between Canada and US, the, the US is kind of rude while they slaughter you and Canada is very polite while they slaughter you. Um, <laughs> and and if, 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 we, if we refuse to play nice, if we make demands, people were upset that we said these are demands, not requests, we're not asking for this, we're demanding this, but if, if we choose to take the power back, then we can actually get some things done. And, and, and that starts very locally. It's about building relationships of horizontal mutual care. It's about the difference between solidarity and charity. Um, and it's about slowly building our capacity, recovering our ability to dream impossible dreams. Forget about neoliberal rationality. Let's be unreasonable. Let's be ungovernable. And we can make things happen. Okay, nice. that's an advice from London, Ontario, nice. Dan. Uh, Ananya. Yeah, so I think that this question of collective power is absolutely crucial, and that it's what gives me hope. So we continue to see the building of tenant power. We continue, to, and I, by that I also mean unhoused tenants, right? 
Um, uh, you know, as a scholar, a great deal of the work I do is try to situate this in a historical context and to understand those moments when significant victories were won, victories um, that seemed unattainable, and yet they were often followed, of course, by repression, but those victories were won. I do think that what I hear a lot in the movements in LA that are deeply connected to movements around the world is a focus on the issue that city governments deliberately want to avoid, um, but that movements are much are, are, are onto them. And this is, of course, the issue that Leilani has repeatedly centered in, in her work, which is that we are at a moment of the massive transformation, the global transformation of housing markets, right? Um, Wall Street investors have been going on a buying spree during the pandemic. We are seeing the deepening of this kind of racialized dispossession and the consolidation of real estate monopolies. And those monopolies exert a lot of political power, as in California, where you know, Blackstone made sure that the rent control legislation was dead in the water. That's one of the key things we've got to have a, a, a laser focus on. And I, I'm, what I'm really hopeful about is that that's what tenant movements, for example, are focused on. When I talk to my unhoused comrades, of course they want a 4118 abolish, but they recognize that that is one piece in this much larger global puzzle. And what our politicians have been doing is completely diverting our attention from those structural forces from which they benefit largely to right, the, the strategies of criminalization and carcerality. Leilani, there was one word that I grabbed here is it's solidarity, not charity. And I, I find that very important. Uh, but solidarity also means that you have to connect with other people, you know, who are not homeless, for example. I mean, the neighbors, you mentioned the Echo Park Lake encampment. Echo Park is kind of a nice neighborhood. It's getting more expensive. But I mean, it's, if you want solidarity, you, you need the neighbors in that community also to, to engage in the same struggle. And that goes the same for London, Ontario. It goes for, I mean, any major city around the world. Leilani, what, what's your take on this? How do you... How do we merge those interests of, you know, a, a struggling lower middle class who are quite often then get poverty up in their face, which is, I mean, I, I live in the same kind of a neighborhood here where I also have people, you know, begging in my face almost every day. It's a different story because there are Roma people coming over to, to just sleep on the streets and, and beg and then they go home. They don't even bring their families. It's a different thing. But it's, I mean, if you have it in your face every morning when you have your morning coffee, it's it's not easy. How do we, how do we make this work together? So we, because it, for some politicians, they feel that their voters want them to kick the, the homeless out because it's messy, it's loud, it's, you know, it smells, you know. I mean, so there are some conflicts there. How do, how do we handle these conflicts? Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think a lot of city governments stoke the conflict, actually, um, and I think their policies stoke that conflict. Um, if you treat homeless people like crap, then the people around who aren't homeless believe that homeless people are crap. And so there does have to be a shift in how city governments engage with people living in homelessness. That's for sure. I mean, the issue you're raising is, do we need more of us engaged in this laser critique that Ananya was talking about, about the housing system itself that's actually global? It's a global system. Those actors in L.A., those private equity firms we know are global actors, actually. This is a global system. And David Madden, uh, a friend and um, an author, academic, has said, you know, we shouldn't call this a crisis because in actual fact, the housing system is exactly as it has been intended to be. It has been created. This is all not happenstance. This is 
a creation by governments enabling these actors, these big private equity firms, pension funds, investment companies, et cetera, to do what they're doing. Um, so I do think we'd need. it would be amazing if we could get all the people who are jammed by this housing system, all the people who are negatively affected by the housing system. It's not just people living in homelessness. It's the tenant struggling to pay their rent. It's the person living in a home and their mortgage payments struggling to make the mortgage payments. They're being screwed by the system, too. I agree with you, Frederick. If we can expand our ambit so that all those folks know that we're all being screwed by the system that is intended to screw us, then maybe we'll, we can have a bigger impact, which is part of what Push the Film is about, in my opinion, is to get a range of people engaged in this issue and being able to name the pattern, that global pattern, right? That's the beauty of the film. Wow, yeah. All roads lead to push. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. No, I, I mean, the intention with push was in some way to, to try to create the language so we can talk about this situation. And I think your, you helped a lot with your words in, in, in the film, your understanding, your take. And I think that is a way, I mean, now you're working with also with your human rights directives. I think those are important tools to to create this kind of unity so we can be more solidarian with the people yeah. who are kicked out to the streets. Yeah. By, I mean, I will say by this system, I completely agree with what Dan and Ananya say. I mean, change comes from people. We know this. It doesn't come from governments. It comes from people. That being said, while there are those who are building movements and there's incredible movements in LA and Dan's group, the Forgotten 519, I think is like stellar, just amazing. There are incredible groups out there. I do feel, for me, there's a role to sit down with these players and hammer them. And I mean, that's obviously what the shift is trying to do, um, but many other advocates as well. Because if we get the people to put pressure and then there's others of us pushing those big actors, maybe things will start shaking up a bit great we have almost like a revolutionary uh, ending of this episode of the podcast really nice to see you uh, speeding up early morning and and uh, ananya roy in, in los angeles uh, what do you take out of this i absolutely agree that we need to think about all of the forms of leverage that are possible right and so while grabbing electoral power might not be the first thing that I think of. I think what we're seeing in liberal cities in the US is how liberal politicians are going to repeatedly side with criminalization, right? Repeatedly remain silent on, on the housing systems issues we were just talking about. And yet we are seeing significant amounts of change. There's going to be some change in LA City Council with candidates coming out of people power politics, right? Mm. Who feel accountable to rent burden tenants, who feel accountable to unhoused communities. It's, it's a really complex way in which one builds power. And it's often not the first thing on my mind, but it is going to be crucial. We've got to reclaim the state. So I should say that, you know, so this is a much bigger conversation. Do we abolish the state? Do we burn it all down? <laughs> and this is where at the end of the day, I want to reclaim the state. I the want... professor says burn the state down. <laughs> I'm like, I'm all like occupy the damn state. It's ours. <laughs> okay. So Dan, some f short uh, ending words from you also from London, Ontario. Um, you know, I think Angela Davis said freedom is a constant struggle and uh, this will always be the case with our movement building and in all of our victories and uh, you know like Ananya was talking about co-optations and Homi Baba talks about how in a situation of colonization there's always this like mimicry there's this subversion there's this resistance what's being co-opted are we infiltrating them are they infiltrating us <laughs> all of this what we are engaged in you know we are um, 
we are struggling for a world where uh, the great abundance of life is not hoarded by a few at the expense of the many. I think there's nothing unreasonable or foolish about that. We will press on in that struggle and we will continue to struggle. Dan Utzorn in London, Ontario, uh, Ananya Roy in Los Angeles, Leilani. Frederick. You are over, you're over there in, in Ottawa. I'm in Ottawa. Yeah, so this was really a, a, a spicy, uh, interesting conversation. Super interesting. We should keep doing this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear more about your human rights uh, directives. Yes, we should I do. I think the, the world needs to know more about them. The shift the, directives. The yeah. shift. So let's, let's, let's plan for that. Okay. Yeah. But now I think it's time for you to walk the dog or something. Or Oh, I no, should... that's long over. That's long no, no. Okay, yeah, so I mean, it's the, lunchtime. It's, it's time, lunchtime, It's time folks. for me to go for a glass of wine, I think. Nice. Is that, Lucky is that okay? you. Yeah, it's Tuesday. Well, when we record this. You've, maybe been, it... you've been working very hard. I know that. I think you deserve a, a nice little glass of wine. I think so, too. Thank you very much, all of you. And um, this is Pushback Talk. If you want to see the film Push, go to pushthefilm.com. If you want to support the podcast, which we do without any funding, Leilani, how, how do we do it? We have a Patreon account. And you go to, I don't know, www.patreon.com. Hmm. And look for Pushback Talks. And every little bit helps. Yeah, it is. It's actually true. And there are 50 people out there doing it. So we are almost rich in, <laughs> in a hundred years or so. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. In an austerity kind of way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah but, <laughs> but we keep smiling. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thanks. Bye. Pushback Talks is produced by WG Film. To support the podcast, become a patron by going to patreon.com slash pushback talks or follow us on social media at make underscore the shift and push underscore the film. <laughs>